slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director, Dr. Maura Cassidy, and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority, ISA, watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. It is November 3rd, 2028, as this week's episode, The Kilohertz War, reminds us how suddenly and mysteriously one man's science fiction can become another man's science fact on the threshold of alien worlds. <laughs> This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Nile Delta. I know we're not expected, but we'd like permission to dock. What's the problem, Captain? The bloody technicians union at Gatwick called a strike while we were still on the pad. Our line crew walked off before they finished refueling us. We'd like to top off our liquid oxygen tanks. Another strike at Gatwick. Third time this year, isn't it? It's a fair. How about it, mate? Can you spare a drop or two of the old LOA? What's your destination, Captain? Uh, we're transporting the King Tut exhibit to Thanatos, part of a cultural exchange program. Stand by. All right, Nile Delta, I have you on the screen. What's your Star Lab ETA? Uh, six minutes, 18 seconds. Six plus 18. Roger. Nile Delta? Your docking orbit insertion coordinates are Niner Niner 6 at 207 degrees, docking bay 16. A refueling crew will be standing by. <laughs> we'll try to keep them from going on strike before we get there, okay? <laughs> Don't worry, Captain. Star Lab is a non-union shop. <laughs> well, thank God for that. <laughs> Nile Delta, out. Bay 16, there's a British freighter coming in for refueling. ETA, six minutes. Roger. Hi, Maura. Hi, Jerry. Have you heard from Major Corbin yet? Yeah, about a half an hour ago. He was just leaving Jupiter space. What's going on out there, Maura? Some unidentifieds have been shadowing the freighters taking Zellium ore off Callisto. The ISA thinks they're mineral pirates. Commissioner White sent Corbin's space exploration team to check it out. Uh, you want to hear his transmission? I have the recording right here. All right, let's give it a listen. Zodiac 1 to Star Lab Control. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Zodiac 1. Corbin commanding a flight of three SET Mirage class interceptors. Pirate suspects identified as Labinthian renegades. Engage two of them. One destroyed, one damaged. No casualties on side. Have the squadron remaining on patrol in the vicinity of Callisto. Other half now departing Jupiter space. ETA at Stargazer Security Station 2130 hours. This is Major Corbin Zodiac 1 out. Certainly comes right to the point, doesn't he? You know him? Hmm. But I've heard John and Buddy mention him a couple of times. I can't remember why. But I do remember they weren't smiling. Here, let me have the cassette, Jerry. I'll be talking to Commissioner White in a few minutes. I may as well play it for him. There you go. Thanks, Jerry. See you later. So long, Maura. That's it, Commissioner. Well, thanks for getting it to me so fast, Mara. Uh, is there anything else we should talk about? The tape you sent up concerning the Terillian military exercises on Mars. I thought Terillia was anti-military. Well, she is, Mara, but two planets in their system have declared war on each other. And Terillia's sitting right in the middle. They're working up a tactical space force to protect themselves. They hate to do it, but they have no choice. 
Why are they testing on Mars? Well, its atmosphere is Torellian compatible for one thing, and it's uninhabited for another. You see, Torellia is very densely populated. They didn't want to take the chance of hurting any of their people, whether it's an experimental weapon malfunctioned or one of their prototype ships crashed. <laughs> Sounds like they've got a lot of soul as well as a lot of sense. Yes. Well, I'd better sign off no more and try to get home. A lot of wind and snow blowing around outside, and you know what New Chicago's like during a blizzard. All right, Commissioner, bundle up. And beware of little boys chucking snowballs. Starlo Communications, out. Major Corbin. It's coming through on the Earth disaster frequency now, and it just tripped the override on the fail-safe attack circuit. Punch it up in here. On the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. An emergency. San Diego burned into the explosion. Military operation. Mars. 2,000 feet. Engine to get people. After unleashing their deadly assault. This is Captain Lansing of the in the evacuation. Blackdown. I told the ISA not to allow those aliens to run loose on Mars. Have you been able to raise Star Lab yet? No, sir, and we've been trying for over an hour now. The Torellians probably took out Star Lab on their way to Earth. All right, Captain. Flash the pre-combat alert to the other ships. We're going to Mars. permission by the ISA to experiment with defensive spacecraft in the Martian atmosphere, Torellia sends 200 prototype gunships to the Red Planet for testing. Ten days later, three Mirage-class SET interceptors receive a powerful radio transmission as they leave Jupiter's space. The transmission overrides their Earth disaster frequency and fail-safe attack circuits and is filled with a confusion of voices describing an attack on Earth from Mars. That's the planet. It's on the planet Mars, between the hours of Hillary White. Destruction of cities and cars. Five the minutes after the transmission is received, Major Ben Corbin, who commands the interceptors, orders his executive officer to contact Star Lab for confirmation of the attack. Have you been able to raise Star Lab yet? No, sir, and we've been trying for over an hour now. The Torellians probably took out Star Lab on their way to Earth. All right, Captain, flash the pre-combat alert to the other ships. We're going to Mars. Open a close proximity channel. I want to talk to the other ships. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Major. This is Major Corbin. You all know what the situation is and what our choices are. You also know that it's the responsibility of a commanding officer to decide which choice is best. But these are extraordinary circumstances. So I believe the decision to either continue on to Mars or to return to base should be shared by all of us. So when I finish this transmission, take a vote. Flight crews and officers alike, it's up to you. Zodiac one out. You're looking unusually tense, Captain. What's the problem? Well, I'm going to see how our crew feels about your pep talk, Major. Pep talk? Is that what it was? I'll be back in a few minutes. Captain O'Neill, Major. We're ready whenever you are. Thanks, Bill. This is Captain Dan Sager. We're with you all the way, Major. I knew I could count on you, Ray. Well, what's the verdict, Captain? Pearson thinks we should return to base and wait for orders. Mm -hmm. What about the others? They're willing to go for it. Fine. What about you? I'm inclined to agree with Pearson. Why? Well, on a strictly legal level, any kind of military action without direct orders is a violation of the ISA charter. Mm -hmm. With the exception of self-defense. What else? I don't think we have enough evidence to prove that the Earth is actually under attack. Let's hold off until we can authenticate the transmission. That transmission's been coming through for two hours now. And during those two hours, we haven't been able to contact Star Lab or get a single response from the ISA on Earth. 
That is authenticity enough for me. All right, suppose the Earth is under attack. 70 to 1 odds isn't retaliation, it's suicide. Come on now, Captain, you can be critical without being insubordinate. Well, I don't know, maybe I can't. Where's the line? It would help if you try to be a little more objective, Captain. This is a military issue, it's not an emotional one. Well, I guess that's the difference between us, Major, isn't it? You're objective, so you put your faith in action. I'm not, so I put mine in reaction. Hmm. What sort of reaction are you having? There's something wrong about this whole incident. You're right, Captain. There is something wrong. There's a war on between Torellia and Earth. Objective, subjective, or otherwise. That is a fact. Flying in a tight triangular formation, the tips of their delta-shaped wings merely touching. The three sleek white interceptors of Major Corbin's Zodiac flight execute a 360-degree roll and rocket away toward Mars. Meanwhile, on the surface of the desolate red planet, the freezing winds of Martian winter blow a stinging mist of iron oxide dust across Cecropia, a vast plain located at the zero meridian coordinates of 70 degrees latitude, 310 degrees longitude. In the middle of the windswept plain lies the Torellian Command Center, seven transparent green domes whose faceted emerald surfaces fracture the pink light of the late afternoon sun. Standing near the domes on legs that seem too fragile to support them are 60 Torellian gunships in the shape of huge chromium dragonflies. Outside the central Torellian dome, Commander Ark Sathos stands looking up at the bleak Martian sky his long, yellow-pleated cloak swirling around him, his delicate lungs protected from the iron oxide storm by the black filter mask covering his face. Like Sapos, the purification elements in our masks are nearly saturated. It's time we return to the dome. The second and third air garrisons. Where are they, Sinparva? They should have returned by now. The planet is larger than we thought, and the targets we selected are in the night region. Our ships have never flown in darkness before. Have you seen to the one that fell onto the ice cap? Three surface crawlers have been dispatched to bring it here. How many of our flyers were killed? We won't know until the crawlers reach the impact site. Sinparva, Torellia was never meant to be... Oxapos! <gasps> Take me into the dome. My mask. The elements have terminated. As Sin Parva rushes his commander into the protection of the central dome, Major Corbin's SET Zodiac flight enters the Martian atmosphere. Descending to 300 meters above the red planet's surface, the three interceptors jet toward the Torellian command center, 2,000 kilometers away. Zodiac 1 to Zodiac flight. Mid-range scanners confirm target interlock. Target description, seven low-density, low-profile structures and 60 high-density spacecraft. Activate laser turrets and shielding generators on my mark. Mark. This is Zodiac 6. We have target interlock confirmed. Laser and generator functions positive. This is Zodiac 3. Okay on target interlock. Okay on laser turrets and shielding generators. Maintain present course and speed. We'll be over the target in 44 minutes. Zodiac 1, clear. How you feeling, Captain? Any better? You know how I feel. Don't worry, you'll get over it. Oh, come 
Come on, Jerry, it's us. Your old pals through thick and thin. SCP captains Buddy Griff and John Grayton. Jerry? Go ahead, Solaris. Yeah, Jerry, where you been? Down in engineering. All our communications were knocked out about three hours ago. We just got back on the air. What happened? According to Professor Crane, a pulsar somewhere flashed back all the radio signals that it collected in its gravitational field. You should have been here. It was really a buzz. Uh, speaking of buzzes, is Maura there? We've got a present for her. She and Professor Crane are up in data processing, resynchronizing the sidereal time terminals on the computer. Hey, have you got a docking bay open? Our ETA is nine minutes. Uh, docking bay 23, buddy. Docking orbit insertion coordinates 671 at 208 degrees. Thanks, Terry. Solaris out. Hello, Maura. Hiya, Maura. Hi, buddy. Professor Crane. John, buddy. Good to see you. How's it going? Jerry told us what happened. We just finished. What's in the box? It's a present from Phil Maxwell. Here, be careful, don't spill it. Oh, it's beautiful. What is it? It's a fish, Maura. <laughs> yes, I can see that. But what kind? It's a flarn, a Serenian glowfish. Phil picked up a couple on Cronus. He thought you'd like to have one for your aquarium. <laughs> that was really nice of him. Does it have a name? Uh, yeah, Winston. A flarn named Winston? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Does Winston need any special food or anything like that? Yeah, my wife has one in her aquarium, Maura. Just put him in the water and forget about him. Glowfish live on light. Hmm. Dr. Cassidy, this is communications. What is it, Molly? We're monitoring the intership transmission from Major Corbin's Zodiac flight. They've just detected the Torellian Command Center on Mars. On Mars? Mars? I'll be right out. Hey, here, Professor. Hold my fish. <laughs> Powerful radio transmission has tripped the fail-safe attack systems of three SET interceptors. A transmission filled with distorted human voices describing an attack on the Earth from Mars. After unleashing their deadly assault, this is Captain Lansing of the Captain the evacuation. Blacked out communication due to the difficulty with transmission. When Starlab and ISA headquarters on Earth failed to acknowledge his calls for confirmation of the attack, Major Ben Corbin reaches a tragic conclusion. The alien assault is real. too fast for our senses. We had no warning. Have you tried to contact them? They don't respond. Hmm? Then we have no other choice but to defend ourselves. Open the barrage domes. Inform our gunners that this is a lethal engagement. Zodiac leader to Zodiac flight. Regroup at 179er. Switch over to target grid yellow. And we'll go around again. Starlab to Zodiac 1. Starlab. I knew we should have waited. I knew it. Starlab, this is Zodiac 1. Go ahead. What are you doing, Major? Get out of there now. Captain. Captain, check the source of this transmission. Major Corbin, this is Commissioner White. Get your flight back to Stargazer and turn yourself over to security. You've got one hell of a lot of explaining to do. But the attack on Earth, there was a radio transmission. 
It tripped our failsafe system. We heard it on the other... We picked up the same transmission here at IRC headquarters, and so did Star Lab. Zodiac 6 to Zodiac Leader. Pull off, Major. The Trollians have opened up a gun recall, and they're tracking you. Major, how much convincing do you need? If you don't give the order to break off this attack, I will. Zodiac Leader to Zodiac Flight. Return to base. Repeat, return to... Direct hit on the starboard thrusters. You've lost the automatic guidance circuits. Switch to manual. Attitude gyros are gone. Co-pilot to crew, get to your crash positions. We're going in. Your orders are to come directly to Star Lab. Commissioner White's on his way up. Roger, Star Lab. Zodiac 6 out. I've finished analyzing the tape Jerry made during the pulsar flash, Mora. The frequency of the predominant voices and the frequency of the failsafe override are exactly the same. 880 kilohertz. But that's an exclusive ISA frequency. It wasn't in 1938. 1938? That's right. The voices were originally transmitted from the Earth in 1938. What was there about the voices that caused Major Corbin to do what he did? Come on. I'll play the tape for you. Whatever possessed you to do this thing, Major Corbin? Three men killed in the crash of your ship. Nine others seriously harmed. Captain Vogel critically injured. Twenty Torellian flyers lost. The transmission. We thought you were attacking the Earth. We... I... did what I thought was right. Did you contact Star Lab for confirmation? Did you contact Commissioner White? We couldn't reach them. Then why didn't you contact us? It never occurred to me. Military uniforms are unfortunate things, Major. So very little does occur to the ambitious patriots who wear them. Mark Sapos. Yes, then, Parva. A transmission from Commissioner White has come through. He wants to talk to you. Sin Parva. Your eyes. Is there something else? There was nothing our physicians could do. Captain Vogel just died. Oh, my God. My God. Between the hours of Halloween's wife, destruction of cities and cars, and the evacuation. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations, coast to coast, has brought you the War of the World by H.G. Wells. Featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Next week, we present a dramatization of three famous short stories. This is the... The Kilohertz War was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller... Corey Burton, with special guest stars Casey Kasem, Jeffrey Lewis, Joe Baker, Olin Soule, Richard Paul, and Pete Renaday. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Assistant to the producer, Roger Brossi. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for another journey into the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds.